Hey everybody, welcome back. The other day I did a video where I answered some of your questions. However, there was one question that you submitted or that one of you submitted that I did not include in that video. And the reason I didn't include it wasn't because it wasn't a good question. It was because I considered it such a good question that it deserved its own video because I believe it's about a topic that is important to all of you potentially watching this. And the question was at what level or what price do I notice the law of diminishing returns? The law of diminishing returns, for those of you who may not be familiar with that term, is at what point do things become so good that you have to then uh, spend a exorbitant amount of money in order to get better? And I thought that this was a very, very interesting question and something that I think a lot of you and myself included face each and every day when we're trying to decide what purchases to make. Because let's face it, in 2020, we live in an era where everything is just kind of awesome all the time. And it's undeniable that you can now get things for hundreds of dollars that once used to cost thousands upon thousands. It is possible or it is conceivable that Let's say back in 2000, 2005, a loudspeaker that would have cost upwards of uh, $2,500 to $5,000. That same performance is easily had or bested in 2020 for 500 bucks. Now that isn't to say that if you purchased a loudspeaker back in that era or circa that time frame, and you spent that kind of money and you still have that loudspeaker today. I am not saying that that loudspeaker is now bad. So if they were awesome, awesome, awesome in 2000 or even 1990, chances are if they're still in good condition and you listen to them every day and enjoy them, they're still good today. That's the beautiful thing about you know investing properly, which is a topic I know we've covered on this show before. With other pieces of electronics like AV receivers, AV preamps, uh, DACs, uh, sources, amplifiers, things like that. Those are products where also the law of diminishing returns come into play, but they come into play because of the just technological advances. What you can get today in terms of like sheer performance and feature set, you may find more readily available on a $500 receiver than you will find on a $5,000 one. And that has to do with the fact that a lot of higher priced receivers or higher priced AV preamps tend to be made by boutique brands. And boutique brands or smaller uh, volume brands, uh, they can't react as quickly, they can't manufacture as quickly, and therefore they can't order parts and or license as effectively as say a brand that mass produces, i.e. you know, Sony, Denon, Onkyo, things of that nature, where, where they're not talking about sales in the hundreds, they're talking about sales in the tens of thousands of units. And when you can buy in bulk or license in bulk, obviously you get a more advantageous deal and that drives the cost down. Yes, it is possible in 2020 now where a AV receiver at say $500 can do as much of the heavy lifting, pack as many features, if not more features, and even sound as good as something that once cost thousands of dollars. So getting back to the original question, at what point for me do I notice the law of diminishing returns take effect? Well, let's break it down into categories. The first being loudspeakers, because I think it's the simplest and I think that that is ultimately one of the more popular market segments where um, people begin to have this discussion as far as like, well, I have a friend and he has X speaker and it only cost him a thousand dollars and I have another friend that has X Y speaker and it, it, it costs ten thousand dollars and I can't hear a difference. That is the law of diminishing returns argument. Well, for me, I have encountered products in my travels and I have encountered loudspeakers in my travels where a $500 loudspeaker has been as good or better than a $2,000 one or even a $4,000 one. But I've also encountered products at $500 that don't even deserve or earn that price tag. So it's not a hard, fast, universal rule or truth. So for me, I think that 
there are a lot of brands, really, really viable brands and really, really good manufacturers out there that make products in the $500 to $1,000 range that punch far, far, far above their weight class. And on a whole, in that price, if you can afford products in that price bracket as it pertains to loudspeakers, I do think that you have to spend multiples, multiples more to best that performance. And that's how incredible things have gotten, how good things have gotten that with a straight face I'm and, and, and no hyperbole necessary, I can say that a pair of $500 bookshelf speakers sound as good or compete very favorably with loudspeakers in the $1,500 to $2,500 range, in which case then it becomes a very difficult argument or an argument that you have to make for yourself as far as how much is going from 90% as good to 100% as good? How much is that last 10% worth to you? When it comes to digital components, we're talking DACs, sources, things of that nature. If you are using any type of source purely as a transport, meaning you are letting a DAC uh, do all of the heavy lifting um, from a processing standpoint, then I, you don't spend any money if you can help it like, on, a, on a transport because you just need to move the ones and zeros down the stream, in which case a $100 CD player or whatever will, will do it for you because you're going to connect it digitally. Uh, so anybody selling a high, high ticket transport, I don't understand. As for DACs, well, DACs come down to chipsets, and, and I know that there's some tweaking that can be done on things like power supply and isolation and blah, 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 reclocking and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, when I look at a lot of DACs out there, they are comprised of largely the same chipsets. And so if the same chipset can be in a $300 DAC that's found in a $3,000 DAC, now we're just talking about things like power supply, chassis, build quality, isolation, and stuff, and that all matters. But at the end of the day, the chip doing the processing, the, the digital to analog conversion, if that is the same, then you're going to be treated to somewhat similar sound. Not saying the same. This is where it gets a little bit tricky and where arguments can start to be formed. But what a DAC is, a digital to analog converter, it's chip based, it's hardware chip based. And a lot of these companies don't make that. They get that from you know, a third party. And if that, if that same third party component is found in a lower priced item as it is in a higher priced item, straight away, in my opinion, you are going to be treated to similar results. Yes, you can always, always, always massage the results, massage the product and get more out of it. But for me, when we're talking about digital components in this realm, the law of diminishing returns can kick in in as low as two to four to five hundred bucks again. The delta then to get that last, that last little five percent maybe of performance costs thousands upon thousands of dollars. And, and you have to decide for yourself if that is something that is worth it. As for like home theater receivers, if you have a five hundred dollar receiver with a quality amplifier in it, it will sound as good, in my opinion, as a $5,000 one. The thing that's going to make the biggest difference is the quality and the power output of that amplifier. And the problem with a lot of budget receivers is the more channels of amplification you use, the less power they're able to churn out because that amplifier, that power section is being shared across the whole spectrum. And so that's why you see a lot of AV receivers out there where their two channel rating may say 75 watts or 100 watts per channel into eight ohms. But if you read the fine print and you talk about their five or seven channel rating, it drops way down to like 30, 20 watts per channel. And that's where a beefier, more uh, call it boutique brand or specialty brand uh, product may outperform a mass market or cheaper product. And so that's what you really have to kind of kind of take into consideration when it comes to law of diminishing returns with receivers. Amplifiers, again, that's all over the map in my opinion because if it really comes down to the topology you want to employ. 
I like Class D amplifiers and Class D amplifiers historically and typically, especially as of late, punch way, 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 way above their price points. In which case it's not impossible to have a three to $600 amplifier perform as good as another Class D amplifier that may be charging you two, three or $4,000. Because there are only so many manufacturers making Class D technology. And if they're all sourced from the same place, then again, kind of like DAX, you're going to get largely or a lot of the same performance. So for class D, I believe that the butter zone is about 500 bucks, maybe 750. Now for class AB, boy, there are examples where a $300 amplifier sounds better in my opinion than a $1,500 one. And it really does come down to how well manufactured and how well designed and thought out that particular product is. Uh, class A, Class A for me gets really pricey. Um, the, the last company that made what I consider to be an affordable Class A product was Emotiva in their 200 watt monoblocks, the 1Ls, I think it was. And these were Class A, A, B switchable. Now these were just, these were masterpieces and I really wish they still made them or updated them and continued to make them. But if you have these units, understand that you, you truly are in possession of something special. Um, outside of that, there aren't a lot of manufacturers dealing heavily in sole Class A. Maybe they high bias their, their Class AB designs to run in Class A for like 10 watts before switching over to AB. That's a totally different thing. But in true Class A, like through and through, past labs are really like the only ones, in which case, yeah, you're going to pay for that. Um, and and that's, that's understandable. And I think past labs are one of those products that are worth every every penny. But in terms of AB, uh, class AB amplifiers, whether it be stereo or multi-channel, I think you can totally get away with $750 to $1,500 before you have to start spending some serious, serious cash to best amps in that market segment. Again, that's just my personal opinion, which brings me to my final point. I know we've been, we've been at this for a little bit, but my final point with respect to the law of diminishing returns and the thing that um, you have to just accept and kind of keep in mind is that the reason, one of the chief reasons why so many people may put together a system at a thousand dollars and go, I can't hear a difference, or I don't think that my friend's system at $10,000 is any better than mine. That comes down to like three factors. Number one is personal taste. There's no denying one's personal taste. And if you like what you like, that's all that matters. And if what you like is a thousand bucks, there is no amount of anything that anyone is gonna be able to tell you or sell you at $10,000 that you're going to agree is either worth it or better. So you are the biggest factor to the law of diminishing returns. Plain and simple, that's, that's number one. Maybe I should have led with that. Uh, number two is your physical listening space. Half the reason why you may not be able to hear a difference isn't because your equipment isn't good enough. It may be because the room or the way that you have your gear positioned, set up, configured or whatnot may be robbing you of those differences. Uh, and then it comes down to, well, but if that's how your gear is set up and that's how you like it, then who cares? Because the only person that has to like the sound of your system is you. And lastly, third, <laughs> it may come down to age. It really, it, it, it may come down to age. Um, there's something that I really wish audiophiles would talk openly about and be honest about. And that is the fact that this is a hobby that is increasingly enjoyed by older people. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We are trying to get young people to pay attention uh, to this. And as a result, we have to address the elephant in the room and what can contribute to the law of diminishing returns, which is everyone's hearing gets worse just as you get older. It's just a fact of life. And so why as you get older, you may sit there and go, well, I can no longer hear the difference. It may literally be because you can no longer hear the difference and that's okay.
So yeah, that is my answer to that question. I thought it was a fantastic question. I am sorry, I do not recall off the top of my head which one of you sent that in, but thank you so much. I hope this video has answered that question sufficiently and that you all got something out of it. But of course, if I left something out or if you wanna to add to this discussion, you know what to do. Put it down in the comments below. And if you liked this video, please do give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already subscribed, which 70% of the people that watch content on this channel are not subscribed. So if you could do me a huge, huge favor, go ahead and hit that uh, subscribe button. But if you didn't like what I had to say or didn't like this video, feel free to give it a thumbs down. Uh, I can take it. We're all big boys and girls here. So anyway, I got to run. We got another video to film, a fun one coming up. Um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. So thank you guys all so very much for watching. And remember, the only person that has to like the sound of your system is you. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for all your support. And until next time, take care and we'll see you on the next video. Bye.